read from the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. If you wish to follow along in your pew Bible, that can be found on page 855. Again, that's Matthew, chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or from figs from thistles? Even so, good trees bear good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Thank you, Brother Thomas, and thank each of you for being here with us this morning. I do want to thank the elders as well as the congregation for allowing me to take some time off last week. Uh, had a had a great trip, but it's always good to be back home. And we missed you all. And again, uh, we are grateful though for the time and opportunity that we have to kind of get away and, and relax a little bit. I also want to, because of uh, some of the things that were, were shared with me by Brother Paul Kelly, I want to just pass along to uh, this congregation the uh, very intense love that Brother Paul had for each and every one of you. And he expressed that to me numerous times when we uh, met together. He cared very much what you thought of him. He worried constantly that uh, his illness and his inability to do some of the things that he wanted to do would keep him uh, or keep you from thinking well of him as a member of this congregation. And I tried to convince him the best I could that everybody understood his illness and how sick he was, but he worried about that. The second thing that was even more important to him, and, and really I'm getting to my point, was he was, uh, I don't want to say obsessively concerned, but he was just, it was at the forefront of his mind, the salvation of his family, and wanting to do everything in his power that he could possibly do to lead them to the truth and to salvation. And this is where you all come in. Thank you to the members here. Brother Jerry Mackey, Brother Robert Taylor, Brother John Mayer, for spending a good part of this week helping the family plan, set up the memorial service yesterday. You demonstrated to Jerry's family how Christian family binds together and how we do for each other and the love that you had for Brother Paul and confirmed the love that he had for you was not well placed, not misplaced. It was well placed. But also, as Brother Mackey mentioned, 
This auditorium was full yesterday. Full. And there were a number of you that were able to be here. I know everybody couldn't be here. Circumstances prevented some of you. But I want you to know, those of you that were able to attend that service so that that family could see the love that this congregation had for Paul. Thank you so much. I know Paul would have been very grateful. And hopefully, hopefully that just played a small role in helping his family to find the truth and find the way and leading some soul to salvation. Thank you, brethren. You continue to encourage me and to uplift me with your love for other brethren and your willingness to do whatever to express that love. One of the things, I guess, that I hope helps keep me humble is the fact that the more I study and the harder that I study, the more I seem to discover, and I really hate to say this, especially with Barbara sitting there, but I'm not always right. And here is what is even worse for me. I am continuing to learn that even when I'm not wrong, it doesn't mean I'm right. Now, let that twirl in your head for a little bit because it's been in mind now for several months as I prepared for our study this morning. When Barbara asked me this morning, what are you going to speak on? I told her. She said, well, that'll be interesting. But what I told her was, I said, Barbara, I'm going to preach or present a lesson that I have never presented in all of my years. And the reason it is, is because I believe and have come to the conclusion that what I have believed and taught most of my life, although it's not wrong, it's not right. Join with me as we talk about bearing fruit. In John chapter 15, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. We're in John chapter 15, we just did verse 1, let's move to verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. In much the same way as Jesus told the parable of the seeds and the sower in Luke chapter 8, one of the illustrations that Jesus uses in the seed that went into the ground, he talks about in Luke chapter 8 and verse 15, the ones that fell on the good ground, who having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it 
and bear fruit with patience. Now, all of my life, I have believed and taught that these scriptures, as well as the scripture that Brother Thomas read to us from Matthew chapter 7, were indicating and teaching about evangelism. That we bear fruit by being evangelistic and, and the fruit that we're bearing is in the souls that are saved because we have been evangelistic and have taught others and led others to the truth. That when the Bible talked about bearing fruit, that's what it was talking about. Now, we know, Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. We know Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter... The entire book of Acts is dedicated to people going out and evangelizing and teaching the truth and leading people to Christ. That is truth. That is right. But what has now come to my mind, and I was actually studying another text when this sort of a light went on in my head, is that although we are to be evangelistic, no doubt whatsoever, Although we do not want to stand before our God empty-handed when it comes to the people that we have influenced in some way to become Christians, that is not the fruit that I believe that Jesus is talking about in John chapter 15, Matthew chapter 7, or Luke chapter 8. And I'm presenting this for your consideration. Study these things and see if perhaps I have been seeing this through the wrong eyes. And again, let me emphasize, evangelism is who and what we are. Don't, this is not in any way saying we should not be evangelistic. But what I believe that the Bible is teaching when it tells me to bear fruit is not talking about evangelism. So what's it talking about? Go with me to the book of Galatians chapter 5. This is what I was studying when this sort of came to me. Because I know we can all be evangelistic, we can all bear fruit in different ways, but it seems to be to say, if I don't teach somebody with my own mouth and they become a Christian that I haven't borne fruit, I don't believe that's accurate. And I don't believe that's the way we should feel. Because the truth can be taught and people reject it. It not bear the fruit that we want. But Paul, in making the contrast that I believe we see Jesus making in Genesis chapter 7, where you have the good tree that produces good fruit, you have the bad tree that produces bad fruit, isn't that Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 through 22? where it talks about the works of the flesh, don't, wouldn't it be appropriate to say that the bad tree produces the works of the flesh and you can see that and know that's a bad tree? And yet a good tree would produce, would show, would display the fruits of the Spirit? And so you would know that is a good tree. Well, let's examine it. 
Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 22. And let's see if the Bible tells us what fruit we need to produce to be acceptable to God. The fruit of the Spirit <clears throat> is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, if you're kind of trying to, to make some sense out of this, if you want to just list those, we're going to look at those as fruits that you and I should produce. And we start with love. And in fact, love defines who we are and what we are. And if we are not producing the fruit of love, then we are not producing what God expects His children to produce. You remember the great chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, as Paul devotes the entire text to love. And he comes to the 13th verse and he says, These three things abide. But the greatest of the three, do you remember what it is? It's love. That's what Christians must produce. In the book of Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is questioned. And we're going to start our reading together at verse 36. Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. First two great commandments. Love. Love God and love each other. John would write in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Brethren, we have got to be producers of this just almost take your breath away love. When people see the love that we have for each other, when people observe the love that we have for God, when people see the love that we have for everybody and everything, it will change this world like nothing ever could. All the problems that we're having. All the hate, all the bitterness, all the meanness. What overcomes it? Love. And we've got to be the best producers of love in this world in every way and in every instance. John chapter 13. Jesus says, you'll know my disciples by one thing. That they love one another. John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. Should we be producing love? We better. Because the early part of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 
says no matter what we do, no matter how much good we may do, and I put good parenthetically in this world, he says if you don't do it through love and with love, he said it means nothing. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. See how important bearing fruit is? It's who we are. It's what we are. Another thing that I hope people observe in us in this fruit that we bear is joy. You know, uh, we were criticized. I say members of the Lord Church were criticized a lot back when I was growing up was our, our worship services were kind of like funerals. Everybody was so sad and somber and everybody was so afraid to smile or to show any joy that I'm afraid sometimes it went the other way, but, but it was true in a lot of instances. My mother made sure that I was not a happy person in services. And I earned it, but nonetheless, there was not going to be any happiness because I was either being pinched, prodded, poked, or dragged out to the cry room just about every service. But brethren, we've got to overcome that and understand that reverence doesn't mean sad and with a scowl on our face. Restore joy to your salvation, the psalmist says. Psalms chapter 51 and verse 12. Rejoice always, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And verse 16, rejoice in the Lord always again, I say rejoice. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. Does that sound like we ought to always walk around with our heads covered and our eyes down and, and like again, we're in, a, we're in a funeral march? No. We ought to be happy. We should be joyful. We should be grateful and thankful that we are in the Lord. And so in everything, we find joy. You mean in times like this, when this nation is struggling, when loved ones are dying, we can rejoice? Absolutely. I'll just tell you, brethren, you take it the way you want to. I'm so happy for Paul Kelly. I can hardly contain myself because he's not hurting. He's not in pain. He worked to be where he is. And I have enough confidence in the God that I serve that he's going to do what he promised Paul. When Christians leave this life, there is no greater occasion ever. I find joy in that. I find joy in God's blessings, sometimes even letting us suffer, letting us reap what we have sown, teaching us lessons. There is joy. Count it all joy, James says, when you endure suffering. Number three, if I'm going to be a good Christian, a good child of God, I am going to have to bear the fruit of peace. We are a peaceful people. That is the fruit of the Spirit. We bring to this world the gospel of peace. Romans chapter 10 and verse 15. In Romans chapter 14 and verse 19, Paul would exhort these saints, you pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which we may edify one another. Romans chapter 14 and verse 19. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11, 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Paul indicates to the church at Corinth and those Christians, do you want to be complete? 
Do you want to be complete in Christ Jesus? Finally, brethren, farewell, but become complete. Be of good comfort, be of one mind, and live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. Sometimes it's hard to live peaceably, isn't it? Sometimes it's hard to have peace in our lives. But nonetheless, it is something that we pursue. It is something that we strive for. And it's something that within our control, we try. What do you mean within our control? Again, listen to the Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 12 and verse 8. Romans chapter 12 and verse 8. If it is possible. Now I'm just going to pause there just for a second. If I say to you, if it is possible, then you naturally conclude it may not be possible. Does that, does that make sense? So Paul says, if it is possible... As much as depends on you. Okay? I can only control who I am, what I am, and what I do. So, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Now, that's who we are. That's the fruit we bear. Are there some people that will not live in peace with me, no matter what I do, no matter what I say, no matter what? Yes! Jesus lived in peace and they killed him. But as a Christian, as a fruit-bearing Christian, I strive, I pursue to live peaceably with everyone. That's what Christians do. That's the fruit that we bear. Number four, we bear the fruit of long-suffering. Mark chapter 13 and verse 13, those who endure to the end will be saved. It's a marathon we're on. We're going to have ups and downs. We're going to have uh, times when we, maybe we question ourselves or certainly the world around us. But Christians are long-suffering. We bear the fruit of long-suffering. Again, listen to the Apostle Paul. The book of Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 1. I therefore, Ephesians 4 and verse 1. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness and long suffering, coming back, bearing with one another in love. Do you are y'all getting how this is all? You know, he keeps repeating and tying all of these fruits together. How they support and they help each other, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, what? In the bond of peace. It's amazing to me. The more I studied this, the more I understood the way God expects me to produce fruit and the type of, per, of fruit. Specifically, Peter would write in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. Considering that the long suffering of the Lord is salvation. If we are long suffering, if we endure, we're going to be saved. That's why it's important for us. That's why it is a fruit that we must possess. And oh, by the way, Peter says, this is something Paul wrote about. Paul told you about this long-suffering and where the long-suffering 
would lead. Number five. Christians bear the fruit of kindness. I've got a rhetorical question. And the reason I say rhetorical, I, every time you know your memory comes up, the elders many years ago uh, came to me where I was preaching and said, quit asking questions from the pulpit because this, the people were answering. And they said, we don't want people answering, so make sure you ask rhetorically. So to be safe, this is rhetorical. How much does it cost to be kind? What, what special skill, what special training, what special gift does it require to simply be kind? Paul told that beloved congregation in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32, be kind to one another. Brethren, I'm suggesting that our fruit of kindness ought to just, again, overwhelm people. They cannot believe the level of kindness that we as children of God produce. Go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I want us to pick up our reading together in verse 12. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, I love that phrase. I, I, that's just that I'm not part of the lesson. I just love that phrase. For me to think I am the elect of God, you know, God chose me. You know, I'm special. As the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies and kindness and humility and meekness and long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. But among these things, slip to verse 14. Sorry, I can't, can't. But among these things, put on love. Above everything, put on love. Why? Because it's the bond of perfection. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Number 6. It's easy to be kind. Sometimes it's not always easy to be good. But we have to bear the fruit of the Spirit of goodness. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. As you have opportunity, do good to all men, but especially those of the household of faith. Christians, children of God, do good and bear the fruit of goodness. I myself, Paul would write, Romans chapter 15 and verse 14, I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness. My prayer is that when God looks at this congregation, that he sees a congregation full of goodness. This is kind of what I was talking about in the beginning. When we were talking about how this congregation reaches out and cares for each other and others. And people see that we are full of, of goodness. 
For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness and righteousness and truth. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 9. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the fruit that we bear. Let your love be without hypocrisy. You abhor what is evil and you cling to that which is good. Romans chapter 12 and verse 9. We're getting there. Bear with me. We need to bear the fruit of faithfulness. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 8, Paul commended those saints because he said, your faith is known throughout the world. Brethren, without faith, it is impossible for us to be pleasing to our God. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Again, a scripture that in years past I've used incorrectly. Again, I was right in what I was saying. I was wrong in the way I was doing it. And that is Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. What Jesus is actually saying here is that Christians are to be faithful even to the point that they are willing to sacrifice their own lives. Be ye faithful unto death. Faithfulness gives us a crown of righteousness. Faithfulness leads us to salvation. I pray that we will always be known as a people of faith. That this congregation will always be known. And people can, can absolutely say with no reservation that those brethren are faithful and they, they produce the fruit of faithfulness. Always. Let us be that prayer. Let that be our prayer and what others can say about us. Number eight, we bear the fruit of gentleness. You know, <clears throat> it's hard for, I think, men sometimes because we're taught that if you're gentle and you're sweet, you're a sissy. So I think sometimes it's hard for us to be gentle. For us to have a spirit of gentleness. Sometimes in our self-righteousness, we become harsh. We become, in our personal relationships, as Peter says, bitter towards others. But that's not the fruit that Christians bear. That cannot be who we are regardless of our gender. This is a Christian principle, trait. It is who Christians are. Listen to Paul talk to the young preacher Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24. You know what he tells Timothy? He says, you be gentle to all. There are some of us preachers that need to take that to heart and make sure that when we deliver a lesson or a study that it's done in gentleness and kindness and goodness and love. And it wasn't just Timothy. Paul told Titus, who was also a gospel preacher, the exact same thing. Titus chapter 3 and verse 2. You be peaceable. You be gentle. 
and you show humility to everyone. Titus chapter 3 and verse 2. But it's not just preachers, and it's not just men. It's every single child of God. Let your gentleness be known to all men. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5. As Christians, we flee the works of the flesh. And we pursue righteousness and godliness and faith and love and patience and gentleness. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11. One of my favorite Bible verses and one that I always try to put into practice and fail so many times. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1. I always... But most of the time this comes after I've already blown it. But listen to what it says. A soft answer turns away wrath. That's gentleness. That's what that is. But listen to what he says. A harsh word stirs up anger. That is so true. And there's been a million times that I wish I could have taken the harshness and and come out with the soft answer. And I'm still working on it, brethren. You pray for me, because I'm still working hard on it. If I can ever get as good at speaking softly as I am at speaking harshly, I think I'll have this thing. But right now, they're still flip-flopped. I need to produce the fruit of gentleness. And last, what Paul says... The fruit that you and I must produce is the fruit of self-control. Do you remember 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27 when Paul was talking about the fact that he is a gospel preacher and he is a teacher. He is an apostle. But listen to what he says. I discipline my body and bring it into subjection lest... When I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Paul says, I need to, to make my body behave, bring my body into subjection, and practice what I preach. Brethren, we have got to understand the tremendous example that you and I have to other people. As fruit bearers for the Lord. In 2 Peter chapter 1, and we won't read this because I, I appreciate your, your kind attention. I know we've gone a little bit longer than normal. But in 1 Peter chapter, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, we call these the, the Christian graces, and it's building up. All of these fruits that you and I should have and work to have and work to show. But at the end of it, verse 8, I want us to focus on that because here's what bearing fruit does for us. If these things, Peter says, are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. If we will bear the fruit of the Spirit, good fruit, like a good tree, then the righteous will flourish like a palm tree, will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, we will flourish in the courts of our God. We will bear fruit in our old age. We will be fresh. We will be flourishing. For to desire the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. 
Psalms chapter 92, verses 12 through 15. The Bible warns, those that do not bear fruit will be cut down and thrown in the fire. Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 9. Cut down by God, because I am unfruitful for the Lord. Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. I hope, brethren, again, this is not any new thing. It's always been there. But it's certainly never the way I have presented bearing fruit. We are to be evangelistic. We are to reach out to the lost. But brethren, there is no reason that anyone in this assembly that is a child of God cannot produce this fruit. No one. No one. I believe this is a better understanding and a better presentation of bearing fruit for the Lord. I'm going to sing the song that Brother Darrell has selected. It is to encourage those in our assembly who may have a spiritual need that we as a congregation of Christians can meet. If you're a child of God and you have not been bearing the fruit that you know that you should have, Or perhaps you're trying your best, but you would like prayers. Prayers to God on your behalf. That you have more strength and more courage, more perseverance, more long-suffering. That you just be better. That you just be wiser. We can do that. We can pray together and we can know God hears us and God answers us. But there may be somebody in our assembly who is not a child of God, who has never stood and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We have to do that. The Bible says it. Who has never repented of their sins, said, I know I am a sinner. And God, I repent of my sins. Who has never been buried Romans chapter 6. In water, for the remission of your sins. Because I have committed sins. I am repenting of those sins. And now, Father, wash away those sins with the blood of Jesus Christ in the grave of baptism. If you haven't done that, then God has not added you to His church. The church that Jesus died for. Why not do that today? If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if you repent of your sins and you'll confess your faith before this assembly, we will immerse you and God will add you. Not because I say it, but because God said it. And God doesn't lie. God tells the truth. If you're subject to the invitation, won't you come as we stand together and as we sing?